ask that the Lord will continue to bless your hearts and your lives and uh, walk on with Him as we have a good time fellowship not only here, wherever the Lord may call you in this pilgrim journey to be able to walk with Him, <coughs> love Him, and serve Him to the very utmost. Now, just by way of uh, words of encouragement, I forgot to mention this this morning, um, but uh, once again, the Lord has been good to us by way of going before us and giving us uh, guidance concerning the building of the chapel and anticipating facilities by we can carry on more efficiently with His glory in this area. As we paid a visit to the health department which is uh, that the department that controls sanitation out in these areas. Uh, we did not know just what were, were the regulations with reference to putting in the septic tank <coughs> and caring for the sewer needs and so forth. And so we've heard so many conflicting stories that we thought, well, we'd better go find out for sure. So we paid the gentleman a visit and he was most gracious to us and uh, just uh, yesterday or the day before I forget when we received the letter through the mail from that visit giving us authorization uh, going ahead and uh, giving us the specifications which we were to follow in putting in our septic tank and bed. So uh, uh, this is good news in fact, it uh, is better than I had anticipated. We had anticipated building a much larger unit. But he said, no, in light of uh, what we have here and the type of ground and uh, uh, the slope and all, why well, this, uh, this would care for it adequately. So again, we're grateful to the Lord. So uh, with the uh, mud drying up, <coughs> and we're able to get now onto the fields, uh, the school is has come to a close, just a few more weeks now. Uh, in fact, uh, three more weeks and college will be over for another year. We trust that each one will remember one another much in prayer these days. Not only for our college young folk, but also for those in high school, those in elementary school, as they bring their school to a uh, close and that uh, it might be Completed successfully, a real testimony. Now then, I would also like to ask you to remember Mr. Pogmans very definitely as he's getting uh, ready now to move up to this company. And we're thrilled that he's coming here. <laughs> this doesn't uh, this doesn't make us a bit sad at all. Now he's got lots of work ahead, and uh, uh, you pray for him, pray for him as he will be moving his trailer house up just as soon as he can. And uh, Ms. Simpson, can I share the good things with the folks here tonight too? Yeah. Mrs. Simpson is a, uh, a very proud grandmother. Uh, again, uh, last evening, uh, twin boys were born uh, to loved ones down in Windsor. And these folks are going to move up into this country too. So uh, uh, this is good news. We just trust that the Lord will bless uh, this family and these two precious little boys and that they'll be raised for his glory in the Lord. Now I believe that's all that I have in the way of special announcements uh, to make. Anything decided for the young people? All right, now let's take our Bibles and turn to 1 John chapter 3, and we trust <laughs> that we're going to finish this third verse tonight. We've been trying now for, for three weeks to get through these three verses, and uh, we trust tonight to do it. This morning we took time out to bring a special uh, Mother's Day message from the 12th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, but this evening we would like to continue on with our series of studies concerning 1 John chapter 3 
especially the first three verses. First John chapter 3, the first three verses. Now tonight, we're going to ask you once again, if you would read with us responsibly these three verses. I'm sorry, in unison, because there's only three. It would be much of a responsive reading it for three verses. <laughs> Let's read in unison these three verses. All right, everyone have your Bible. First John chapter 3, the first three verses. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath his hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Let's bow together for another privilege. <clears throat> now our Father, again we're so grateful for this privilege which is ours of fellowshipping together in the world. We're thankful for these good things which have come our way this week. Good things from thy hand, thy way of health, thy way of meeting our needs, <coughs> the beautiful weather that has been ours, and the fellowship which we've enjoyed one with another, and especially now for the season, close of another Lord's Day. Thank you for the good things from the Word of God, the spiritual food which the Spirit of God has been pleased to feed our souls on. And now our Father, as we look into your word, these uh, few fleeting moments, may the Spirit himself be our wonderful teacher. May we be enlarged spiritually, give us understanding, whereby we might have hearts to rest upon truth uh, more fully, and then lead us on in this pilgrim walk in a way that it will bring glory to you and blessing from our own hearts. And our Father, again we would bring to you those who are suffering from the physical point of view. Grant our God just that blessing, both from a physical and spiritual point of view, upon Mrs. Kuhlenbaumer these days. We do not know her condition at this time, our Father, but you do. We would pray that you will die the surgeon that you will guide our Father, those who care for her. And may this time be a time when the Spirit of God, some way, somehow, might do that good work of grace in the hearts and lives of all of these dear ones. We thank you for each one in this community. Pray that the Spirit of God will be the portion from thyself to meet their hearts. Father, again, Accept of the sacrifice of our praise. We would ask again that the Spirit might illuminate our understanding and that our wills might be submissive to the truth of the Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now again, we would like for you to watch your Bibles, <clears throat> and I'd like to read the first three verses that we have before us <clears throat> in 1 John chapter 3 like to read it from the Greek text. You will note there is just a slight change as we have pointed out from time to time, but nothing whereby it is of such great magnitude that we should make too much of a point of it. Nevertheless, just to try to clarify the wonderful truth. And as I read, again, let me suggest <laughs> for you this little outline <coughs> that will be of help, I believe, in seeing the progression of the truth of these three verses. In verse 1, we have the marvelous revelation from God with reference to what we are. Then when you come to verse 2, the precious truth of who we are. And then in verse 3, that exhortation and on the basis of all of these things, how we should live. And again, I believe these three verses in a real way act as an introduction to the entire third chapter of 1 John. And if you will read 1 John chapter 3, 
with these three verses as an introduction, I'm sure that many of the problems which arise in these verses will be solved by the Spirit of God in light of these three. Now you watch your Bibles and let me read for you again. Behold, what kind of love the Father has given to us in order that we might be called the born children or the born ones of God. And we are. This chi esmen is in the Greek text, which is not in your English. And we are. For this cause, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are the born children or born ones of God. And it is not yet manifested what we shall be. We know that if he should be manifested, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone having this hope in him purifies himself, even as or just as that one is pure. Now, very briefly, very hurriedly, by way of review, let me just simply point these highlights out. Verse 1, with reference to what we are, behold, we are startled to attention. We're startled to the attention of one great and glorious truth, and that is of the kind of love which is before us. And remember that this is the emphasis. Behold, let us have our attention drawn to the kind of love which is here. What kind of love is it? Well, it is love, if you please, that is from the Father. And this term, of course, emphasizes endearment, one that reaches to the heart, not one who's austere, not one who's greatly separated from us, one that we can have an, a close association with, our Father. And you will notice the sort of love, the kind of love which is before us is from the Heavenly Father, which is by pure grace he has given to us. What is the purpose? The purpose is that we might be the called ones, the called children of God. And this is how one becomes a born child of God by the grace of God as he gave his wonderful love from heaven's glory in the form of his lovely son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that whosoever would believe in him might be born from above might become the born children of God. And then we have for this cause, there's a consequence. For this cause, the world does not know us because it did not know him. You see, when we become children in the family of God, there's a great separation that takes place. There's a separation as far as our relationship is concerned. We are separated from the world unto the Father into the family of God. Thus there becomes an estrangement, if you please, for not only the children of God, but for God himself with reference to the world. The world simply does not know us. The world simply does not know us because it has not known God. In other words, the world cannot understand, colloquially speaking, what makes the Christian tick because he does not any longer have that unique relationship to the world that he once had before he became a saved individual. Then when you come to verse 2, who we are, first of all, the vocative address, beloved, special letter, if you please, to a special group of people, those who are the loved ones. In other words, those who become the recipients of this kind of love, this kind of love which has its source in heaven, coming from the Father by pure grace. And then once again, please note the next two, the two clauses. Now we are the born children of God and has not yet manifested what we shall be. Now in these two clauses, I believe that we have an emphasis relative to our pilgrim journey. We are the born children of God. Yet, in a real sense, we are marking time. Isn't that right? We're here for just a little season. And while we're here, it is not yet made clear to us. Remember, the window blind hasn't been lit up yet to let us see 
what we shall be. That is not completely revealed for us. But then last time we simply closed with the next clause before us. But even though we're marking time, we are not marking time as those that do not have a purpose. And here, I'll tell you, this is thrilling to me. Because, you see, as we mark time, as we walk by faith, we also walk in understanding. We know. We know. We don't guess. We have an innate ability about us when we trust Christ as our Savior. We have a mind known as the mind of Christ. In 1 Corinthians, we don't have Christ's mind, of course, to make us omniscient, but we do have a mind of the same spiritual caliber which enables us to think spiritually. Now then, we innately, by virtue of being a spiritual person now, we know something, that if he be manifested, we shall be like him. Now, I'm sure there are some of you here this evening who have taken Greek and have your Greek Testament, and you will notice that we have a subjunctive uh, mode here. Now, would you bear with me, folks, for just a moment as I try to explain a possible problem for those who would see this. Now, the subjunctive mode is that mode of hesitancy or contingency. Now, the reason we have the subjunctive here is not the fact that the event will not come, but the contingency rests upon the time it will come. We know that if he should be manifested. Now, we do not know when he's going to come. That's the doubtful part, isn't that right? We don't know. We're anticipating his imminent return, but we do not know. That's only the prerogative of God. God only knows when he's going to send his son back for us. You see, it is not <clears throat> the event which is doubtful, but we do not understand the time. That is the thing which is contingent upon the sovereignty of God. But we do know this, that if he would be manifested, should he be manifested right this moment, ah, oh, here's a wonderful and glorious reality, we shall be like him. Do you see something here with reference to this little verb to be? Now, <clears throat> this little word to be, any, is a word which denotes existence. Our existence, in other words, we know that if the Lord should come at this very moment, or whenever he does come, we who are the born children of God, we who become the recipients of this kind of love which has come from a Father, from a heaven, by pure grace, that our existence is going to be just like Christ. Now, we are given some wonderful and glorious passages of Scripture that give us some hint as to the character, and condition, and state of existence as far as glory is concerned. But listen, we are earthbound creatures. And let me call to your attention just two individuals. Daniel for one, John the Beloved for another. Daniel, as he was praying, the heavenly messenger broke in upon his presence. And because of the glory that Daniel saw, he fell flat on his face. He couldn't get up. John the Beloved, when he was exiled to the Isle of Patmos, that isle where we find him, 
when he is used of the Spirit of God to write the book of the Revelation, he was there because of the testimony of the word of the Lord. When the Lord appeared to him, what happened? He fell down. You see, for us in our fleshly bodies, we are earthbound creatures. We walk here upon the face of the earth. This is our ability. We were created for this earth. We were created of this earth. We were created in this nature, in this state, to have our being here. But for heaven's glow to break through upon us in all of its power and all of its glory, there wouldn't be a one of us that would have physical strength to even be able to stand or sit in the presence of such tremendous glory. All of us would be prostrate on the ground. But listen, we know that if our wonderful Lord should appear this very moment, we who become the born ones of God, we shall, we will have a state of existence just like this. Do you know why we know that? Here's the reason. Look in your Bible. Because. Because we shall see him as he is. You and I can't see the Lord, can we? You and I can see with the eyes of understanding right now, that's all. You and I can see with the eyes of faith, that's all. But I can't see the Lord. You can't see the Lord with your eyes, can you? Listen, do you know what this word means? <clears throat> There are a number of words in the Greek New Testament which means to see. There's blepo and there's horao, two of them. Blepo <coughs> means generally to see with the eyes. Horao means to be able to see in general. But its main emphasis and with reference here, means this. Not only to be able to gaze, but also because of gazing, then to enter in to fullness of understanding. Um, how can I explain this? I'm going to go back to an illustration, which is true in my ministry, a number of years ago, when I had a student pastor out of Dallas Seminary in Electra, Texas, a little oil well town there in Electra, Texas, a young couple began to attend our services, just a little small church, about as uh, large as the group that we have here this evening. And <coughs> Jay and Brian, they just simply began to eat up the truth. Bryna was a young lady that was very, very expressive uh, with uh, her eyes. And one evening, I'll never forget it, as long as I live, it, she embarrassed herself. I'll bet she turned to many colors. She was sitting there like this, watching her wife. And I was trying to explain I just stopped. You know, she said it so loud that everyone heard it. She just kind of sunk down like this, you know. <laughs> well, I just had to stop and laugh. But just as soon as she said it, you should have seen that girl. Her eyes just, oh, I see it. Well, what had happened? It had broken in upon her understanding. Yes, she had been seen with her eyes. She
had been following her Bible as I was preaching, as I was teaching and explaining. And all of a sudden, she saw it. <laughs> she never did that again. But uh, uh, I, I thought it was, uh, well, I, I kept her about it afterwards. But um, it was such a wonderful illustration that, yes, we can see things with our eyes. But finally, we see things with our understanding. It dawns. The light breaks through, doesn't it? All right. Here, in this verse, we know that if our Lord should appear now, we should be like Him, because then we will see Him, and when we see Him, it will break forth in all of our understanding in perfect clarity. Would you turn with me back to Philippians chapter 3, where we have a, a, a very precious commentary upon the matter of when the Lord returns and how we're going to be like. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. Philippians 3, verse 20. For our citizenship is in the heavens. Uh, you watch your English. I'm reading from the Greek text. For our citizenship is in the heavens, from which also we eagerly anticipate the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our weak body of humiliation and transform it, conform it to the body of his glory. Listen, it tells me in Philippians chapter 3, a good commentary to 1 John 3, 2, that when he comes, when he is manifested, he's going to take this whole body of ours and just ah, quick, in light of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 51. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, we shall be changed. Made like unto himself. Fashioned like unto him. Oh, listen, folks. This is the kind of love that I have. Oh, what kind of love? What kind? It's from the Father that has made child in God's family. Who am I? I am a beloved one. Maybe I don't act very lovely, but I'm beloved of God. And now as I mark time in this pilgrim journey here below, I mark time by faith with understanding. It's settled in my mind. I know. Why do I know? I know because the Word of God says so. I know that I've got a blessed and glorious, wonderful, marvelous hope that when He shall appear, I'm going to be like Him because then the veil of flesh will pass away and I shall see and then to see I shall fully understand. Gloriously, all right, on the basis of this, who I am, I'm a child of God in hope. Now then it tells me something in verse 3. All of this in verse 1 and verse 2 is all what God has done. By His marvelous love in grace. <clears throat> now then, when I come to 1 John chapter 3, Verse 3. Now then, the scene switches for just a little. On the basis of what I am. On the basis of who I am. In light of the wonderful hope that I have. There is a way that God says I should live. 
Now this, this is the verse that gives us the power. All of the other is by sovereign grace. And how I can rejoice in sovereign grace. But now there's an appeal. There's an appeal to my will. There's an appeal to my responsibility in verse 3. Now let's look. And everyone having this hope in him, do you have it tonight? Have you been the recipient of the love of God the Father that's made you a child in his family? The Bible teaches us something. The Bible teaches us that when we're saved, and when we're made a child in the family of God, the Bible tells us that we are not left to live just any old way we want to. I'm one that holds tenaciously to the secure of the belief. I believe the Bible definitely teaches us that when you're born of God, like the Bible says, that you're born, that you become a child in His family. And because I believe this, I have often been accused of something. Oh, you're one of those people that believe that once you're saved, then you can go out and live like the devil. still be saved. I said, listen, let me tell you something. That's just what you said to me. That isn't what the Bible says. Once you're saved, once you become a child in the family of God, you know what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to live like a child. children in our families. We expect them to live like children of our family. Isn't that right? And when they do things that they shouldn't do, well, what happens? You know what happens? What happened to you when you was a kid? My mother always said it didn't happen enough. Let me give you a problem, can I? Since I've had it, I'm going to just pass it on to you. Isn't that a good thing to do? <laughs> After all, if you have a problem, you can't solve it. Why well, just pass it on? Let someone else solve it. All right. <clears throat> the Bible tells me that I'm a sin. And, ex and by experience, I have to agree. The Bible fully teaches us that we're depraved individuals. And by experience, we have to agree. Now, 
then, will you please tell me how? A depraved, godless, hell-bound sinner is going to purify himself. Make himself pure. Make himself holy. Will you tell me? Now, I want to warn you of something. There's a group of people that believe. salvation that the Bible talks about is a salvation by grace, not works. And I puzzle this and I puzzle and I come to this word and the Greek word here, the first one is hognize and the next one is hognos. And both of them come from the same root. And behind this word Basically meaning, it does mean to make pure. But now, let me give you a clue. In the first verse, everyone having this hope in him, he purifies himself. The subject is the child of God and he's to do the acting. <clears throat> How can I fulfill this wonderful exhortation on the basis of the grace of God bestowed? <clears throat> How can I do it? And then to make things more difficult, he gives me the standard as he is pure. suggest for you. I believe to be the answer. Since it's absolutely, absolutely impossible for you or for me to do anything to purify us, to purify ourselves. We cannot help our defiled soul. this be the case, and it is, <clears throat> then we must go to the basic meaning of the word. Do you know what the basic meaning of the word is? It means holy or pure from the standpoint of being separated. Now, let me illustrate. <clears throat> As I've often illustrated. Now, there's another Greek word behind us, and I'm aware of it, but we'll come to the context in just a moment. I went into the bookstore down in Dallas Seminary, and I wanted a nice Greek testament, and I saw it on the shelf. <clears throat> I asked the price of it. I purchased it. I removed it from the shelf, and I made it mine. I sank that book. I separated that book. Sanctify to make holy, to make pure, basically, first of all, means a changed place. Removed from one place to another. It means to be set apart. I set apart this Greek test. I took it off the shelf I made it mine. No longer did it go back on that shelf for sale. It was my property. Now, <clears throat> verse 3. Verse 3 <coughs> is a verse that has basically behind it that thought. Now then, let me try to prove it for you. You all got an assignment for this next week. Verse 3 is that introductory verse 
to the rest of the third chapter. And it is a life of separation <clears throat> or a life's practice of separation using the Lord, if you please, as the example in light of the context, not in light of him being incarnate, as the liberal talks about following Jesus. No. Now here is a little outline. And you may take it down if you want to. In verses 4 through 12, <clears throat> 4 through 12, we have sanctification in light or the life set apart in light of sin and love in the family. See? It's a life's practice set apart in relationship to sin and love in the family. In verses 13 through 17, 13 through 17, the emphasis is a life's practice of being set apart from the world and love. Now, in verse 18 through 24, 18 through 24, here is the next emphasis. A practice of a life set apart unto the word and love in the family. These three things. It's a life's practice in light of sin. It's a life's practice in light of the world. world. Life's practice in light of the word. But in each one of these three paragraphs, the emphasis is always love in the family. And why shouldn't it be? Because we are the recipients of this kind of love that's meaningless, born ones in the family of God. And here is, it's the most wonderful thing. In, in the rest of this chapter, using verse 3, everyone that's having this wonderful hope in himself, he is what? He's setting himself apart as that one is set apart in relationship to sin, the world and the word, but with every paragraph saturated with love and family. Spend some time in it this week. But just in closing, can I ask you this question? Are you a recipient of this kind? from the Father that's made you a child family. Or are you a child of the Destitute of a hope. And you have to honestly in your heart get in by a natural relationship. And I might want it, and I might do everything else. The great burden. God says there's only one way. It's got to be the spiritual way. And that's got to be by a heart's faith. In Jesus Christ. Trust in Him. 
just receive. And you know, folks, I don't, I don't know why. Some want to make it so horrible. Because this, this is being the recipient of love. I don't know.